He was a young Pharisee, zealous for learning the law of God and living it out perfectly. He spent his days studying and memorizing the Torah, the law of God. <clears throat> and he was beginning to be recognized for his exceptional devotion to God. And so he had become a disciple, a student of one of the most respected Pharisees in Jerusalem, and had quickly risen to the top of his class. It was because of his uh, devotion, his uh, just zeal for God, that he found himself with a rather odd assignment. Uh, he'd been invited to a gathering of the elder Pharisees of Jerusalem as they got together to deal with a crisis in their midst about what to do with this Jesus of Nazareth, this would-be prophet. Uh, you know, the crowds were following, reporting miracles, and, and, and they had to come up with a plan because he was challenging their spiritual authority. And so it was that this young Pharisee's master came up with a plan and gave him the task, the assignment, of finding the right woman. Now, uh, he and his cohorts, sort of a religious police force, were looking for that right woman. And when we talk about woman, they weren't concerned with specifically who she was, but more importantly, what she did, because they were looking for a woman of the evening, uh, a harlot, a professional, whatever you want to call her. And so they found one, they staked her out, and at the appropriate time, they um, invaded her business, uh, and they caught her in the act, and they yanked her out of the bed and out of her house and dragged her through the streets of Jerusalem. Not because of who she was, but because of the reality that she was a pawn in their plan. They met up with the elder Pharisees on uh, the Temple Mount because they knew that Jesus was there teaching that day. And they dragged the woman through the crowds, pushed their way through the crowd around Jesus, and pushed, him in, pushed her in front of Jesus. This young Pharisee stepped back, and he listened as his master unfolded the plan. He said, with sarcasm, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. In the law, Moses commands us to stone such women as these. What do you say we should do with her? It was the perfect trap, or so they thought. If Jesus agreed with them that she deserved to be stoned, then the crowds would see that Jesus was just like the Pharisees, only dressed in different clothes. And his credibility would be the same as theirs. They could live with that. And if he excuse the woman's sin, if he challenged the law of Moses, well, then they could accuse Jesus of blasphemy and they could stone them both. Problem solved. So his master confronting Jesus, saying, what shall we do with this woman? And Jesus ignored them, stooped down and began to draw on the dirt with his finger. His master continued to press the question, we wasn't going to let Jesus off the hook. Finally, Jesus stood, looked at the elder Pharisees, and said this, Let the one of you who is without sin be the first to cast a stone at her. The young Pharisee braced for that first blow, that first rock that was going to be tossed that, that, as the stoning would commence, and it didn't happen. And he turned to look at his master, and he saw his teacher turn and leave. Followed by the other elder Pharisees, and, and, and his own peers began to follow after them. And, and suddenly his world came crashing down around him. Could it be that they were unrighteous? No, this, his teacher was the most righteous man that he'd ever met, and yet he was leaving. Was he admitting guilt? Were they, in fact, guilty? His head began to spin. His worldview was crashing down around him. He, he shuffled after the crowd and then stopped. He had to see what would happen next. 
He had to know how this story was going to play out. And so he turned back toward Jesus. He blended into the back of the crowd as best as he could. And he watched as what seemed like years passed as Jesus continued to draw on the dirt. It was really only moments before Jesus stood, and this time he addressed the woman. He said, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And the woman said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. To the young Pharisee, those words rang out as words of authority, as if, as if Jesus had the authority to condemn her, as if he was the one who was righteous, as if he was the one who could pronounce her guilty, and yet instead withheld the judgment. Neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Go and sin no more. This young Pharisee had never heard an invitation to freedom like that. He, he'd never encountered anyone that, that actually promoted a changed life. Redemption. Honestly, it was the first time in his life that he'd ever seen grace. And he suddenly realized that mercy was a beautiful thing. The story is found in the Gospel of John, the 8th chapter, verses 2 through 11. I'd encourage you to, if you have your Bible or your Bible app, to turn there and, and look at the story. Uh, obviously, I expanded it a little bit. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1062 and you'll find John chapter 8. Uh, and as always, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, please take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. And I'd encourage all of you to, to read this passage several times this week simply because it is so powerful, an illustration of Jesus and forgiveness. And as we continue our Freeway series today, I want you to know that the path to freedom passes through the door of forgiveness. Freeway is a series that we're in that, that is a not-so-perfect guide to freedom, and it's about all of us uh, living in the freedom that God created us to live in. And, and the truth is, we, if we're going to get to the freedom that God wants us to live in, we've got to deal with this issue of forgiveness. And forgiveness is a huge obstacle for many people. It's a huge roadblock on their journey to freedom. And, and so we're just going to talk about it today because we need to receive forgiveness from God. We need to extend forgiveness to others. We need to forgive ourselves if we're going to live in the freedom that God has for us. So the path to freedom passes through the door of forgiveness. And we've got to come to terms with mercy because truthfully, we are all the harlot. We are all the woman in the story. And I know, you didn't come to church to be called names today. I get that. Uh, but we've all stood in the place of that woman in the story, the adulterous woman. We've all been there when the crowd was accusing us or when we stood before Jesus and we knew that we were guilty. And, and I know that we're all the harlot in the story because we're all guilty. We're all guilty. I know this because the Bible says so. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, the Apostle Paul says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Last time I checked, all means all. All of us. But here, let's just go ahead and do a little example. I'm not going to ask you to you know, raise your hand or confess publicly or anything like that. But, but the truth is, uh, we're guilty if you've, if you've ever told a lie. If you've ever been selfish, if you've ever expressed anger poorly, if you've ever drank too much or ate too much or slept too much, if you've ever betrayed a friend or deceived someone, if you've ever cheated, whether it's on a test or your taxes or a person, 
If you've ever stolen something or had evil thoughts, if you've ever lusted after someone or been envious or greedy, then we are the harlot in the story. See, we're the ones who are guilty as we stand before Jesus, as we stand before the Holy Son of God. Uh, we've been caught in our sin. We've been exposed as lawbreakers. And that's why it's really good to know that the offer of grace precedes repentance. See, I love this story because we see grace firsthand being lived out because Jesus, in the midst of it, where the woman is guilty, standing there before him, there's never a protest that she's innocent. She might be framed, but she's not innocent. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. The righteous, holy Son of God, who has the authority to condemn, who has the authority to judge, in fact, he is the judge of the living and the dead, withholds judgment, withholds condemnation of a guilty woman. Let that sink in. You and I are guilty. But Jesus hasn't condemned us. In fact, Jesus has acted to save us, to forgive our sins, to, to provide salvation for us. He's actually paid for our crimes. Now, a lot of you probably already know John 3, 16. A lot of you could even say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. But I would be surprised if very many of us in this room knew John 3, 17. Jesus goes on to say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn people, I came to save people. I didn't come to bring judgment, I came to bring hope and life and freedom. And, and the apostles echo that. The apostle Peter, in, in his first letter, says, For you know it was not with perishable things such as gold or silver that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. That's how you were redeemed, Jesus the Apostle John writes in his first letter, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. So we're guilty, but, but Jesus offers grace. And so I want you to know today that grace is available to you. Jesus' words, neither do I condemn you, are for us. And this grace is available to you because Jesus provided for it, he paid for your sins, and he offers you a new life. Every one of us, a new life. And I also want you to know that freedom is found in receiving mercy. Freedom is found in receiving that mercy. That offer of grace, that offer of a new life. The offer to turn away from your sin and to follow Jesus into freedom is what is waiting for us. By the way, that's what repentance is. Repentance is simply saying, I'm letting go of the captivity and I'm following Jesus to freedom. I'm, I'm, I'm disengaging from the destructive life and I'm going to engage life with Jesus. And that's where freedom is found. Now, it does irritate me a little bit that the story doesn't tell us what happened next. I don't know if you get that way, but sometimes you, you want more details than the Bible gives, right? It just kind of stops right there. I want to know what happens next. So in my mind, I just go ahead and write out the next story. So there's no indication in Scripture that one of the Pharisees suddenly realized who Jesus was and, and changed his life. I just like that idea. I just made that stuff up, okay? You guys know that. That's why I want you to read the Bible because, you know, I'm telling a story the way I see it. But, um, but we don't know what the woman decided either. I mean, the story just stops, and Jesus is saying, hey, I'm, I, here's an offer of new life. Here's an offer of freedom. You can let go of that destructive past, and you can step into a new future if you'll receive my mercy. And we don't know if she said yes to Jesus, and she became a follower of Jesus, and her life was changed, or if, we, or if she just said, cool, I don't have to die today. I'm going back to prostitution. We don't know. But see, that's the choice that all of us have. To receive forgiveness that Jesus offers and leave our lives of captivity, of destruction, of sin, or 
just to continue living in captivity. Every one of us has to make that decision. You see, all of us, well, I think most of us know that the thrill of rebellion quickly becomes a harsh master who owns our souls and hates our lives. Just ask any addict if they ever intended to be where they are. It started off as all just fun and they didn't want to give up their family, their job, their career, their lives, their health for it. And Jesus offers us a way out. He offers life change. He offers forgiveness, hope, joy, eternal life. It's freedom. He's, he's saying, look, this is for you. So what choice are you going to make today? You're going to receive mercy. You're going to follow Jesus. You're going to say, Jesus, I want a new life. I want you to, to, to change me completely. I'm going to surrender completely. You see, that freedom begins when we say, Jesus, I believe you're the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world. I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sins. I, I believe you're raised from the dead, and I commit my life to following you from here this day forward. Now, the, the truth is, some of you haven't done that yet, and, and God is calling you to do that. And some of you have done it, but you've gone back to captivity. Aren't you tired of visiting freedom for a few hours each week? and yet living in captivity? Because Jesus is calling you to change your life. He's calling you to follow him actively and let him set you free. And it's not easy, but it's real. So what choice are you going to make today? Because we're all the harlots standing there before Jesus when he says, neither do I condemn you. And we are all the Pharisees. We're all the accusers. And, and you know, when, and, I, and I say that, I wrote this in the notes, and I, I don't even like hearing myself say it, because I don't want to be the Pharisees in the story. I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, I want to be on Jesus' team. Anybody else want to be with Jesus when you're, yeah, and that's, that's what I thought. See, so I grew up in the church, I grew up hearing this stuff, and I knew the Pharisees were the bad guys, so I'm like, I don't want to be like the Pharisees, I want to be with Jesus. And I'm okay being the, the harlot in the story, because I know I've been forgiven, but I don't want to be the bad guys in the story. But the reality is, I am. We are. I mean, at some point in our lives, all of us judge other people. We all condemn other people. We accuse them. We accuse them of not living up to our standards and our values. Right? Parents, have you ever watched your adult children, you know, kind of let go of some of the things you taught them? And you're like, you shouldn't be doing that. And suddenly, accusations come out. You know better. We accuse people of having the wrong theological or political or economic viewpoints. And usually when we accuse them, we include disparaging remarks about their intelligence. Right? Those idiots. I can't believe they believe this stuff. If you're, if you're doing that, just don't do it on social media, please. Okay? I mean, you know, fight that, that, that accusation because we're, we're guilty of it. And, and, and let's be honest, we judge the way people live their lives in, in so many ways. I mean, if I ask you, are you judgmental? Most of us are going to go, no, we're not judgmental. But we judge the way people live their lives all the time, right? We judge the way people drive. Guilty. Okay? If you can listen in on my car and what I'm, you know, uh, the judgments I'm pronouncing. And it doesn't matter. You're judging people too, whether they drive too fast, too slow, you know, what, you know it just... We do that, and I repent a lot, but uh, it, it, I'm still tempted to judge. The way people, but it doesn't stop there. We judge the way people raise their kids. Some of you have been in the grocery store, and you're like, well, if those were my kids back in my day, you know what that is? That's a statement of judgment right there. You're condemning them. We judge the way people dress, the way they wear their hair, their clothes, or decorate their bodies. We, we judge other people. We judge the way people do their jobs. We're all the Pharisees. We're all accusers. And sometimes when we're judging them, we just want to dismiss them. We want to treat them as if they're insignificant, unimportant people. Just get out of my way. And other times, if we're honest, we want blood. Blood. 
Are you aware of the rocks in your hands and the accusations in your words? Are you aware that, that, that we're comfortable being the bad guys in the story, being the Pharisees? Let me put it another way. Is your attitude primarily one of forgiveness or accusation? Are you living out a life of forgiveness or a life of accusation? Are, are you approaching people that you encounter with grace or with judgment? Because all of us in here want to receive mercy. We're all pro-mercy when it comes to us. I want God to forgive me. You want God to forgive you. We want to be forgiven by other people. But are you living out the, the grace of God toward others? Because if you're not intentionally living out the grace of God towards others, you're probably living out accusation. See, my guess is most of us have people in our lives that we love to accuse. People who have wronged us, people who have hurt us, people who have cheated us, some people who have just caught us. And we don't like being caught. And we don't want to forgive them. And somehow we believe that that if we hold on to the anger and the bitterness in our hearts, that it's going to cause them pain and nothing can be further from the truth. Do you know why God tells us to forgive? It's because when we forgive other people, the grace of God flows through us and out of us and it cleanses our hearts of all the anger and the bitterness and the rage and, and the unforgiveness that is there that is poisoning our souls. And so when you extend grace to other people, it cleanses your heart and it and it allows God's mercy to flow through you. And you're going to have more joy. You're going to have more life. You're going to have more hope as you forgive others. So, Jesus set the example. She was guilty and he withheld judgment. He withheld accusation. He gave mercy even though judgment was deserved. Are you willing to do that? And it doesn't mean that you continue allowing abuse. It doesn't mean you allow people to steal from you or hurt others. It just means you let go of the anger and hatred that is poisoning your soul. And you have a conversation with Jesus about mercy. Now this is not easy, but if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then this is what is expected. It means that you get honest with God. By the way, I, let me encourage you to always be honest with God. But it means you get honest with God and you say, God, I don't want to forgive them, but you told me I'm supposed to and I want to obey you. Okay? Because that's where we start. Every one of us starts at that point when we're, when we're angry, when we've been hurt by someone. Whether it was 50 years ago or yesterday, we have that anger over the hurt. And we've got to be honest with God and say, God, I don't really want to do this, but I want to obey you. And you told me to love my enemies and pray for those who persecute me, so I'm going to pray for them, and I'm going to ask you to bless them, even though I don't mean it yet. <laughs> okay? But that's being honest with God. You don't feel it. You're just doing it out of obedience. But you have a conversation with Jesus about mercy, about that person who's hurt you. And what happens is God shows up, and he's like, yeah, let me just remind you of how much I've forgiven you. Let me just remind you of how much you hurt me, and I am not holding that against you. And pretty soon, uh, if you do this long enough, and it may take days, it may take weeks, it may take decades, it doesn't matter. If you keep doing this one day, you're going to be praying for that person, and you're not going to feel angry anymore. And someone's going to mention their name and, and your blood pressure is not going to go up and you're not going to clench your fists or your teeth. And you're going to realize that you've had the conversation with Jesus enough about mercy that it's real in your life. Are you living a life of forgiveness or accusation? And, and let me just be a little bit practical and maybe a little bit mean. Are your words... Is your actions toward your spouse forgiveness or accusation? You know what accusation sounds like toward your spouse? You always, you never. What about your kids? Are they hearing words of grace or are they hearing words of condemnation? What about your coworkers? What, what, what part of you do they encounter? Do they, do they encounter the person that knows the mercy of Jesus and lives it out? Or do they live, know the person who is all condemnation all the time? See, here's what I, I know for certain. If you're a person of accusation and condemnation, you can't represent Jesus well to the world. 
Our mission here at Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And you can't love people when you're condemning them. So how you live in your life? Forgiveness or accusation? Finally, what I want to share with you is just an encouragement to forgive yourself and agree with Jesus. Forgive yourself and agree with Jesus. Uh, Jesus doesn't condemn you. We've already covered that, even though you're guilty. Why are you condemning yourself? Why are you condemning yourself? Yes, I know you've done terrible things. You've made horrible mistakes. You've hurt people. You've failed miserably. Guess what? God knows it too. He is not unaware of your mistakes. And you may think, well, yeah, but everyone else is. Probably not. In a room this big, let's just talk about the labor, labels that fit us. Because we're a room that is represented by addiction and adultery and abortion and abuse, both as victims and victimizers. We're a people that are thieves and liars and vengeful. We, we've been dealers and manufacturers and distributors of drugs. We've, we've engaged in prostitution and pornography and embezzlement and murder and assault. And if I say those words and you sit there smugly and go, none of that applies to me, then how about this one? Self-righteous. Okay, all that is true. And Jesus knows it. And he's not condemning you. He's offering you mercy. So why are you picking up the stones and punishing yourself? Agree with Jesus. Just agree with your Savior who loves you and gave his life for you and forgives you. Forgive yourself and God will redeem your failure if you just embrace mercy and follow him. You see, the path to freedom passes through the door of forgiveness. And the door is open. And we desperately want you to choose mercy, to enjoy mercy, to experience mercy, to share mercy, to know the grace of God, which is beyond comprehension. What are you waiting for?